Hello, everyone, and we're glad to have you back. If you were looking for lesson number two in this series, uh, I didn't, I, I recorded it, but I recorded it incorrectly, so I didn't put it on YouTube. This is actually the third sermon on uh, this uh, command. It's a command by Jesus not to worry. It's actually a part of our study on the Ten Commandments. We're studying the Tenth Commandment, and I'm not going to show, I've done this uh, before, but not show how this particularly uh, fits into the Tenth Commandment like we have in the past. We're just going to take up where we have left off in our previous study. And so I do want to remind you what we looked at the last time when we talked about Jesus' command about don't worry, don't be anxious. He uses two different words, but the main word that he uses is the word for worry. And we saw in our last sermon on this subject that uh, if we are to obey this command, Jesus tells us how to overcome worry. And he says, the first way that it must be done is we have to think biblically. We have to think correctly. And we looked at four things that Jesus said in these verses. He said, the way you think correctly is, first of all, you need to think about what God's already given you. And so if he gave you the gift of life, and is he going to fail to give you what you need to uh, live that life? If he, you know, your life was given to you. You didn't create yourself. You didn't even ask God for it. He gave you life. And his point is, if he did that, don't you think he's going to go ahead and take care of you as well, give you what you need? And so that's a thing to think about. So you're talking about thinking. He's just talking about a consider, think about these things. And then secondly, think about God's creatures that are much less valuable uh, than you. God takes care of them, and you're much more valuable than them. You have an eternal soul. You were made in the image of God. Don't you think he's going to provide for his own children? And then Jesus said, think about the fact that worry doesn't change anything. And you can't add, um, you know, any little uh, part to your life. Whatever God's determined, you're going to live on this earth. You can't change that. You can't add to it. So why worry if it doesn't affect anything? And then the last thing that we saw that Jesus said, think about the quality of your life. We um, many times bring our feelings in, um, into account and we let our feelings take over. And as a result, we don't think correctly. And so basically what Jesus is saying here is we need to bring our feelings under control. and We need to think and reason correctly. So that's what we saw in our last lesson. And that's the first point. We need to think correctly. We need to think biblically. But now I want to look at the second point that he makes here in this passage. And that is uh, we need to be ashamed uh, that we are thinking like unbelievers. And so Jesus said, and don't seek what you're to eat and what you're to drink and do not be anxious. And so this is the first time that he's used the word anxious, which is very similar to being to worry. But he says, uh, uh, this is what you're to do. You should be ashamed, he says, if you think like an unbeliever. I think that's a very good way of summarizing what he says here. Don't seek. Um, uh, don't seek what you're to eat and what you're to drink, and don't be anxious. He's not saying there's no legitimacy in at all in thinking about what you're going to eat and drink and what you're going to wear. These are necessary things. They're the necessities of life. But what he's saying here is he's talking about being preoccupied with these things. He's talking about your whole life's purpose being about these things right here. And he gives us a very good reason why we shouldn't worry about these things. He says, for after all these things, the pagan world seeks after. You see, when you think, when this preoccupies your life, when you're preoccupied with what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, your cars, your house, your retirement, when you're anxious about money, having more or not having enough, 
He says, what you're doing is you're acting just like people who are unbelievers. He's speaking of uh, pagans, those who don't know God. He's telling us very simply that when your mind is preoccupied with anxieties like this over material things, food and drink and clothing, your life, your circumstances in this world, he's saying you're living and behaving just like a worldly unbeliever. And anytime you as an unbeliever act and think like an unbeliever, you should be ashamed of yourself. That's what he's telling us right here. Because after all these things, that's what the pagan world, he says, seeks after. They're preoccupied with these things. That's their life. That's what they live for. This is what dominates someone who's not a believer. It's what controls them. Food, drink, cars, houses, retirement, investment funds. That's all they have. That's why they think about it. That's all they have. Now, you just think about that. You think about people who are not believers and tell me that that's not all they're thinking about. Their life is dominated thinking about those things. And Jesus is saying, you should be ashamed if you're a believer, and that's what dominates your thinking. Because we have something else to live for. They don't have anything else to live for, but we're God's children. We live for the kingdom of God. We have a much higher purpose in life. And additionally, in seeking the kingdom of God, he's promised that he'll give us everything else we need to boot. Here's what he says in the next verse. Nevertheless, seek his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. That word added, it's the idea. These things will be given to you to boot. You have a higher purpose. You are to seek the kingdom. You are servants of God. You are to promote his interests and his cause. And he's going to give you all these things. He'll add these things. He'll give them to you to boot. Now, you know what to boot means. If some merchant uh, sells you a car on, on TV, you might see an ad. They say, they say now, if you buy this a car from us, I'll throw in a lifetime of oil changes to boot, you see. Or if you buy three of this, we'll give you a fourth one to boot. Well, Jesus is saying that about our material needs. He says, if you seek the kingdom, if that's what you're doing, you're working for me, you know what you're here for, you know what your purpose in life is, why I created you, and if you just do that work right there, he says, you know what I'll do? I'll throw in food and drink and clothes to boot. I'll give you everything else you need to boot. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, don't act like a pagan. Don't act like these unbelievers that we live around. So that's the conclusion that he draws here. That's the reason he says. So how do we overcome? Um, uh, worry? How do we overcome anxiety according to our Lord? Well, look at our outline. First of all, he says we got to start thinking correctly. Think about what he's already done for you. Think about how um, more, much more valuable you are than other things that he's created. Uh, think about the fact that worry doesn't change anything. Think about the quality of your life. You see, you need to start thinking correctly. And then he says, you need to be ashamed uh, when you start thinking like an unbeliever. And now the third and last thing I want to notice is he says, think about your relationship to God. Now, Jesus is telling us to do a lot of thinking, isn't he? Isn't he? If you want to overcome worry, and if you want to overcome anxiety, he's telling us you got to do a lot of thinking. Have you noticed in this passage? I was reading an, an article earlier this week, um, just happened to be reading it on um, uh, cannabis. And they were talking about how that when people uh, smoke uh, marijuana and things, they, their feelings start taking over more and they don't think uh, they did these tests on people and they actually gave them some uh, 
cannabis and they gave and they didn't to others. And then they tested them. And the conclusion they came to was it affects their thinking. They start feeling and their feeling affects their thinking. Well, that's what Jesus is saying. Don't let that happen. We need to do some thinking. We need to think correctly. And one of the things we need to think about is the nature of our relationship that we have with God. After speaking of what characterizes pagan unbelievers who live around us, what does he say here in verse the latter part of verse 30? For after all these things the pagan world seeks after, but your father knows that you need these things. Now, you'll notice what Jesus didn't say in this verse. You notice if you hear me preach much, I always like to look at a passage and say something, well, it's not saying this, because you can learn a lot about whatever God's teaching us sometimes by looking and seeing what he's not saying in that passage. And what is not Jesus didn't do and he didn't say was this. He, Jesus didn't turn to God and he didn't tell God, you know, these people, these disciples, they need these things. He didn't do that. He didn't turn to God and he didn't tell God, remind God, hey, your people need these things. Rather, he's speaking to his disciples, not to God, and he's reminding them, your father knows that you need these things. He knows. God knows. He knows everything that you need. And when we seek his kingdom, as we have seen, what happens? He tells us that all these things will be added to us or given to us, as we saw, which is carries the idea be given to you to boot. You seek the kingdom, which is what we are. That's our purpose. That's what we're called upon to do. We're his people. We're his servants. We're citizens of his kingdom. And that's our goal is to promote those interests. And when we do, guess what? Our king is going to take care of our all these things. He'll add them. He'll give them to us to boot. Now, Jesus draws our attention to at least two different things here. First of all, he reminds us that we have a special relationship to God. We, and he has a special relationship to us. And how do we know this? But because he calls, he calls God our father in verse 30. He's our father. We have a special relationship to God. If you are a believer, God is a father to you. And what kind of father is God? Well, Jesus has been laboring to remind us that God is a father who cares for his children. He's a father who has promised to provide for his children what they truly need, what's best for them, not necessarily what we might want. You know, lots of children want a lot of things, but parents, all parents, I suppose, even the worst parent on earth knows that not everything a child wants is what they need. And our father is a perfect father. He's a loving father. And we may want some things and he doesn't give them to us. Well, we can be assured because he's such a great father. He's a perfect father that, well, we didn't need it. He gives us what we need. And he's not a stingy father. Listen to what he says. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father is delighted to give you the kingdom. I want to call your attention. There's a lot of other words I could call your attention to, but I primarily want to call your attention to those four areas that I've underlined and, and bolded and highlighted uh, the, the, uh, the four words father and then delighted and then give and then the kingdom. You notice that Jesus reminds us that God has given us the kingdom. But I want to just talk about, first of all, he gave it to us. He didn't sell the kingdom to us. We don't have to earn citizenship in the kingdom. 
We didn't deserve salvation. We didn't deserve the kingdom. He freely gave it to us. It's like people caught up in maybe a war that's going on right now. And another nation just uh, opens up their borders and gives them citizenship. They didn't do anything to deserve it, but they were given citizenship. God freely gave us the kingdom. When we seek whenever, or whenever we're preoccupied with the interest of his kingdom, what does he do again? He just gives, in addition, he adds to boot the idea, of, that's the idea of our food, our drink, our clothing. Now, why, would, why should we worry? If we're seeking his kingdom and he loves us and he's a giving, he's a generous father, why should we worry that he's not going to take care of our material needs? You see, our seeking the kingdom, by the way, is evidence that he's already given us the kingdom. I love this um, song. It's written 150 years ago by a lady. But um, anyway, I, I love this verse. The first verse of this song is all I'll quote. She, she wrote in her hymn, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. It was not that I found, oh, say true. No, not I, it was not that um, I found, oh, Savior, true. No, I was found of thee. And that's true. We didn't go looking for God. He loved us first. He sought us out. And he is a giving father. He's not going to do that and then forget us. But the other word I want to, to talk about is this idea of delight. He delighted, Jesus says, he delights, he delighted to give you the kingdom. He's not reluctant. He's not grudging. He doesn't do it grudgingly. A lot of people sometimes might give things to other people, but they do it grudgingly. He's not grudging to give us salvation, to give us Christ, to give us the kingdom. You want to know something that really makes God glad? You want to know something that really makes God happy, really happy, makes him rejoice? Well, Jesus tells us. If God is our father and it gave him great pleasure in giving us the kingdom, what do we have to worry about when it comes to food and clothes and, and, and things like that? I want you to think about this. If you are a believer, what kind of father is God? To you well he's the father that has set his love upon you as we've just seen he decided to adopt you way back before the creation of the world ephesians chapter one we were children of wrath we were deserving of wrath we were stained with sin and he decided to adopt us and to give make us his very own sons and daughters and furthermore, he paid an infinite price to adopt us as his children. You know, when people adopt children nowadays, it usually takes some time, but it is usually very costly as well. But when God decided to adopt us, it cost him infinitely, an infinitely greater price. God's wisdom went to work to devise a way that the heirs of wrath, which is what we were, would become heirs of the promise. How could sinners who have broken God's law time and time again, enemies of God by nature, deserving of eternal hell, how could we ever be made right with God without, uh, without God being unjust? How could he bring us to love uh, uh, to himself in love without defiling his own holiness? How could divine justice, which must punish sin, be satisfied without destroying us as sinners or without him failing to be just? Well, a way was provided, but it wasn't a cheap way. When he signed the document to make us his children, the adoption papers, and signed it with the blood of his beloved son. There's nothing more dear 
to God than his own son. And yet he poured out his wrath upon his son on the cross so that we might be free from wrath and the judgment that we deserve and that we might become sons, adopted sons and daughters, and we might have the kingdom. And since God gave his own son, do you think there's anything else that he that we need that, that he gives? Having given us already his best, do you think there's anything else that we need to live in this world for as long as he's determined us to be here that he won't give us? And that's the argument that Paul makes in, um, in uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 32. He said, if God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, um, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If he'd do that for us, he'll, he'll give us everything else as well. And remember that God knows. He freely gives us. He's our father. He's freely given us everything that he's given us. He's very gracious. It makes him happy. It delights him to do so. And he also knows. So I want to go back to that word, no. Now, the last time we preached in, in, in a, this, on these uh, verses, uh, the first sermon in this, uh, in this series, right, verses, we, we sang a song at this point. Uh, my Jesus knows, and God knows. We're reminded of that again. He knows. he knows that you need these things. That's what he says. He points out that he's all known. God knows everything. He knows all about you. You, we have to remember. Jesus is saying you need to think. You need to remember some things that we will never be in a situation that's outside God's knowledge. We will never be in a situation that's outside his care. He knows our situation. He knows it better than you do. He knows more about you than you do. He knows more about your situation than you do. And you will never be anywhere that he doesn't see you. Um, I wish I'd have put the song that we sang in the last sermon up here again. Uh, we have a service, a live service, and we sing that song, My Jesus Knows. It has wonderful words to remind us that, Je that Jesus knows. He knows all about us. Uh, this passage here, Jesus is telling us, he's giving us these facts because he want, about God, who is our father, who's adopted us as he, into his family, because he wants to reassure us that he will care for us. And if, if we're reassured and we really understand and really believe these things, we won't worry, will we, about those things? He knows the needs we have. He knows what tempts you, by the way, to worry as well. He knows what tempts you to be anxious. He knows the pain in your heart. He knows every internal, every external need that you have. He knows every spiritual need you have as well. And from these facts, our Lord draws this conclusion. That we never have any cause at all to worry, to be anxious. Uh, the word uh, the, for anxious, it's translated anxious, means to actually be distracted. You know, you can just be pulled many different ways. And uh, surely you felt this in your life at different times. You know, maybe you're going through something really difficult. You may go to work, but you're worried about this family situation, that, and you can't hardly even think about your work, and you can't think about anything really well because you've got all these things pulling you in different ways, in different directions. That's anxiety. But if we ever grasp this one simple truth and truly believe that this one truth alone would cause all anxiety and worry to be to be temp, uh, over temporal physical needs to, to disappear. Never allow yourself to think that you are left to yourself because you're not. Your father, our father, if you're a believer, our father knows, he sees, he takes care of you. Jacob 
He saw Jacob running away. He was running away from home, wasn't he? He was out in the middle of nowhere. He was all alone, sleeping with a stone at, uh, for a pillow. There was no one there. He was never, he was running away. He would never see his mother again. Separated from everyone, every friend, every family member. There he is, all alone. And he reminds me of many people who feel that way in this world, whether uh, wherever they are. Many times people reach this point. I've, I've met people who are in prison and they feel like, you know, they're all alone. They have no friends, no family. It's a terrible place to be, but God sees. God is there. God saw Jacob. God took care of Jacob. We see God saw Joseph. He saw Joseph unfairly treated by his brothers. Have you ever been unfairly treated? He saw Joseph sold as a slave by his own family. He saw Joseph being unjustly cast into prison. Joseph might have been asking, where's God when, when all these things were happening? But God saw him. God knew his situation. God took care of him. God saw Ruth and Naomi. Remember those two destitute widows? Ruth had little hope of a life of anything except singleness and hardship and poverty in a foreign country where she probably doesn't even speak the language well, if at all much already. And she's going to be all alone when her mother-in-law dies in that foreign country. But they weren't all alone. God was there. The, God says in his word that she just happened to go into a, uh, a field that was owned by Boaz to glean. Yeah, sure. If you know that story, you know that that's not, that didn't just happen. That's called irony, by the way. It didn't just happen that she made it to that man's field to, to get uh, food. It was God's providence. God saw Paul and Silas in prison, chained in prison in a Philippine jail. And uh, their heavenly father knew all about their situation. And the same true of you and me. Whatever our circumstances are, you and I must learn to say that what our Lord himself said in the shadow, under the shadow of the cross, when his family and his friends had all deserted him, his disciples were about to abandon him. This is a really good prayer to remember. This is what Jesus said, and this is what we need to remember as well. He said, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each of you to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And that is Jesus' promise to all of us who are in Christ Jesus. And there's one other passage. There's so much to teach on what we're talking about, but there's one other passage I'll remind you before we close. This is a tremendous passage. This is one of the strongest statements made in the entire Word of God. It's a quote from the Old Testament, but the he Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your life be free from the love of money. As you see, if you're, if you're preoccupied with that, you're going to worry, aren't you? Let your life be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself said, now this is the part, this is one of the strongest statements, by the way, that is made in God's word. And I tried to translate it this way so that you'll see that this, you, you can't hardly make a stronger statement. And it's not translated you can't translate it in other languages as strong as it is in the original but this is what god himself said i will never ever and really if i were to translate it well i will never ever 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 that's kind of the idea here um, neglect you 
nor will I ever, ever, ever at any time forsake. That's, that's exactly what he's saying. And I'm telling you, that is a, there's probably no passage in all of God's word that is stronger stated in that passage right there. That's from the Old Testament. But don't ever forget, God will never, ever, ever leave you and forsake you. Ever. Well, let me ask you, are you free from the love of God? Are you content with what you have? Let me tell you something. If you are a believer, you're commanded to be. And if you're worrying about these things, you ought to be ashamed that you're acting like people out in the world. There's no circumstance in this life that should ever lead us to worry and anxiety if we are believers. So if you're still the slave of things, if that is what you live for, um, you live in fear. You live in anxiety. Because money and things have, have, uh, have uh, become more important to you than the kingdom of God. That's consciousness, you see. There's more to life, though, than food and clothes and cars and lands and money and retirements and investments, which will all perish in the end. In fact, God offers you, if you're not a believer, the kingdom. And if you are a believer, he's giving you the kingdom. It kind of reminds me of what I hear about the Air Force in Colorado. Um, they're not allowed to have parts. people who go up there to uh, who are in the Air Force aren't allowed to have cars, but they say, well, we'll give you a, a plane instead. And don't worry about these God taking care of us. But on top of that, he'll give you the kingdom. Wow. And God sincerely offers it to you if you will put your trust in him alone. May God bless you.